But should we get started? So welcome to the, this is our pharmacy ethics web series, uh, co-hosted by the SCAG School of Pharmacy and the University of Colorado's Center for Bioethics and Humanities. I'm Mike DiStefano. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Pharmacy here at Colorado Anschutz, and I'll be the host and moderator for today. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, though, I'll just give a little background on this series and go over a few housekeeping items. So this is a web series about ethical challenges and opportunities in pharmacy, and it's intended for current and prospective students and trainees, as well as practicing pharmacists. And our topic today is the ethics of compounding pharmaceuticals, and specifically, You've probably seen headlines about GLP-1 drugs like Ozempic, Wegovi, Munjaro, Zepbound. These are in high demand and some are in short supply. And one response to this demand and has been rising production and sale of compounded versions of these drugs. So we're going to explore the questions that this trend is raising for pharmacists and patients, as well as doctors, regulators, and others. Uh, before we jump in, just let you know that this program is being recorded. Uh, so we'll send a link to the recording to everyone who sent an RSVP. We'll also post it on the CU Center for Bioethics and Humanities website within five business days. Uh, as some of you probably know, there's an eclipse that will happen depending on where you're you know, calling in from potentially during this call. So if you do need to jump off to go see that, we won't be offended. Um, and again, this recording will be made available uh, in a few days. If you have any questions for the panelists today, feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, we also had a ton of questions submitted in advance, and so I will try to get to as many of those as we can today. And then after this program, you will receive a very short survey, and please do fill that out. We use your suggestions to improve the program and select future topics for the series. And with that, I will briefly introduce the panelists. Uh, their full bios, bios were, will appear in the chat if you are interested. So with us today, we have Dr. Andrew Timothy Craftson. He's a clinical associate professor of internal medicine uh, and the director of the weight navigation program at the University of Michigan Medical School. And then we have Dr. Gina D. Moore, She's the Senior Associate Dean for Operations and Regulatory Affairs and an Associate Professor at the University of Colorado Skaggs School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. So welcome to both Drs. Craftson and Moore. And we're going to introduce this topic today with a three minute clip from an NBC news story that just aired about a month ago. The same length. For New Jersey hairstylist Kelly Fadigan, maintaining a healthy weight was never an issue until she had a child. I had my son, and we all know after 30, things just kind of start to change. Fadigan wanted to try Ozempic, the diabetes medication that is also shown to be effective and popular for weight loss. But the reality was at $800 a month, it wasn't something that was sustainable for me. When there's a nationwide shortage for a drug, like Ozempic's active ingredient, semaglutide, FDA rules allow for what's known as compounding, the art of mixing and custom making medications. I am on my way right now to get my first shot. Set that down. Fadigan was able to get her hands on compounded semaglutide, first from a local med spa for $300 a vial, then an online site. She loads the syringes herself. I was just told to sanitize the top of it each time. Pull back a little bit. Robin Bogner is a professor at the Yukon School of Pharmacy and teaches proper compounding techniques. When there's need and there's a profit, people will get involved in compounding. Dozens of compounding pharmacies across the country are mixing their own versions of compounded semaglutide. And while some of the facilities are inspected by the FDA, the drugs they make are not. The agency has issued warnings that compounded versions of semaglutide may carry more risk and negative side effects. The big issues with 
obtaining compounded semaglutide is I don't know where these molecules are coming from. I don't know how pure they are. What else is being uh, added? Social media sites like TikTok are flooded with influencers plugging promotions for various compounded medications. I have a discount code. So you're going to use my code Lauren50. Our team wanted to see how easy it was to get compounded semaglutide. We tried eight different telehealth sites that didn't require any blood work. Using our real health information, we shouldn't have been approved, and all but two sites did turn us down. But with one, after a quick consult with a doctor. I'm qualified. Okay, five questions and that's it. Great. This nausea kind of sucks. Kelly Fadigan has documented her experience on TikTok and is now sponsored by a telehealth company. She says she's comfortable with the choice she's made. I feel like when you feel like you have no other options, you jump for it and, and, and do what's necessary. For her, the reward outweighing the risk. For NBC News, Melissa Lee, New York. Okay, thank you for that, Malia. And Dr. Moore, I believe you brought a few slides of introduction to give some additional context on this topic. Great. I did. Thank you. I know I can't help myself. I'm. It's like the the um, pharmacy professor in me. But at any rate, um, so I thought the the video was great. It painted a great picture of a lot of the issues. I think that we're going to talk about today. Um, I just captured a few slides. I promise I won't um, do too much other than the quick, maybe a couple minutes, just to give an introduction. But as the video touched on, the ads are out there. When I did a quick look of ads that are out there on the internet, it, it's truly crazy. Um, I get ads via social media myself pretty commonly. Um, but I think a couple things are worth pointing out here. Generally, the compounded meds tend to be um, run about just under $300 every four weeks, which tends to include um, some type of appointment or monitoring, which is unclear exactly what that means because you're getting just glossy ads on a, on a website. But I think it's important to also note a few things about this. The compounded meds come, as best as I can tell and as what I can see, in vials. So many of the adverse react or adverse events that have been reported to the FDA and others are some of the dosing errors that individuals just don't understand how to dose and self-administer as opposed to azempic and other medications that are packaged um, in self-injector pins that make it much easier for patients. So I think that's important to consider as well. Um, I wanted to point out, these are the FDA approved agents. You probably know them just as well, if not better than I do of all the different drugs that have been approved in this class um, in the last several years. But I think it's important to note, you can look at the trends of 2023, 2024 in terms of the adoption and revenue associated with these drugs, which you all know is, is quite expensive. And I think the thing to consider as we go through this is access and affordability of these medications. And, and that really plays into ethics questions. Um, if you look at just the phase three trials, and I think this is important to consider, there's a whole lot of drugs that are coming down the pipeline in the next several years. These are just the phase three trials. There are many more in phase two as well as phase one. So you'll start to see a number of different medications that, that are in clinical trials that will hopefully soon to come to market. We might see a little more competition in terms of pricing. Um, and availability of these agents as they become more widely available. Unclear at this point, though, clearly a lot of these are, are still quite expensive. I think it's important to point out, and I want to just spend a minute on this, compounding pharmacies that we refer to. There's two types of compounding pharmacies that we might refer to. 503A which um, are the traditional compounding pharmacies. So pharmacies really built on compounding, if you think of the history of pharmacy, but that is the traditional type of compounding pharmacy. They produce compounded prescriptions for individual patient orders. They're not preparing those in, in bulk. The oversight or the regulatory agency that inspects those pharmacies are the state board of pharmacy. Each of the boards have rules that govern compounding practice. They're regulated by also the United States Pharmacopeia, 
product dating um, is generally beyond use date. Um, and FDA inspections generally are just for cause. As opposed to the 503B, which are the large compounding pharmacies, those are actually registered and inspected by the FDA. Granted, the FDA has limited capacity to, to inspect all of these 503B pharmacies, but these are the facilities that manufacture drugs in bulk. Um, typically will sell to hospitals or to physicians or clinics as opposed to direct to consumer. Um, they are, in fact, regulated by the FDA, regulated under what's called CGMP or current good manufacturing practices. They are randomly inspected by the FDA, but, um, but again, the FDA has limited capacity with all of their, their inspectors to to really look at these, but these, the 503B do have a higher bar in terms of some of the qualifications and inspections and um, documentation that they must provide in terms of both stability and sterility. Um, we'll talk about these. I'm going to stop um, at pause right here because I think we're going to get into a lot of the questions, but I think some of the safety concerns that we're going to talk about deal with some of the salt forms of semaglutide. There have been um, certainly reports of counterfeit um, semaglutide. Um, just recently, a product purchased within the U.S. supply chain at a New Jersey retail pharmacy contained insulin as opposed to semaglutide. Questions about medical spa oversight, and I would offer, and I think you all know, that these drugs are not benign um, that I think we'll talk about in a little more detail. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back over to you, Mike. Thanks so much for that overview. So we'll start with just a straightforward question that either of the panelists could feel free to answer. But you know, for those who are not familiar with the clinical data on these drugs, you know, what is it that we know about the effectiveness of these drugs for weight loss? How well do they work? I can take a stab at that. Uh, so the medications work very well and for a majority of people. So we know that for a highly effective medicine such as semaglutide, you're going to get in clinical trials for folks who are also on lifestyle intervention, over 90% of the individuals will lose at least 5% of their weight, which is considered clinically meaningful. And as you go up to different uh, weight loss markers, you will have a lower percentage, but still quite significant such that for something like terzapatide, you'll have over a third of the patients being able to lose 20% of their body weight. So if we think of bariatric surgery in that 30 to 40% total body weight loss category, these medications are starting to approach that of procedures. So it is quite significant. And for the way that it works, and we probably will talk about more the specifics of how they work, but for some individuals, it is transformational and how they navigate through hunger and cravings. And, and what do we know, I guess, right currently about you know, how long patients have to be on these drugs, right? These are obviously not you know one injection and done, but there's some long-term use that's required, correct? Sure, so as we reorient ourselves to considering obesity as a chronic disease, then it would make sense that a chronic disease would require chronic management. And so these medications are not cures for obesity, but they are management tools that are sustainable for the duration of time that you're taking them. So this is a, a certainly a hot topic area, and we do have clinical trials data looking at what happens when you uh, discontinue the medication, and you can see approximately 80% weight regain. Um, but people are certainly interested in why is it not 100% weight regain. And there's, there's a lot left to be discovered about um, is there some degree of durability of the effect. But, you know, if you're just talking about the medication effect, it is a management tool. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what are some of the reasons why we've seen shortages for various forms of these drugs. And in addition to shortages, would either of you be able to just talk us through some of the other access barriers that patients may be facing with, with getting 
um, these drugs prescribed. And I'm sure I can start with that, but happy for Dr. Crossan to jump in too. Um, clearly, it's a lot of supply, supply and demand issues that the supply of the medications is just not kept up with the demand. Um, other reasons for it are you saw some of those auto injector devices that were produced by Novo Nordisk um, reportedly per the company that the bulk chemical they could obtain, but the actual auto injector devices were, were in short supply to package the medication. So um, that's that's certainly been a big reason. I think we also have to take a trip back on in memory lane. So I actually started, um, I am old enough to remember the the onset of being able to prescribe these medications. So we had Bayeta, which is a bit different, Xanatide, which is using Accendin, you know, derived from the Gila monster and not the current um, derivation of GLP-1 and GIP that we're using now. And, you know, in 2005, when it came onto the market, uh, it was a hard sell. It was a twice a day injection. People did notice that their diabetes, um, for which it was originally indicated, that their diabetes control improved and that they required less insulin. But, you know, even until 2015, when I would work with learners in my clinic or talk to my PCP colleagues, people still thought of these medicines as new medicines. Um, even a decade in. And so there was not a huge um, up, uptake to these medications. And then when Saxenda, the first Incretin mimetic that was approved for weight control, uh, you know, liraglutide approved under the name Saxenda in 2015, once daily injection, so not twice daily. And it worked very well, particularly for, for some folks and moderately well for others. Again, it didn't make a big splash. So it really wasn't until 2017 when Ozempic started to gain traction that momentum started to build. And so I I haven't talked to anyone in the industry specifically, but I do on one hand anticipate that they were not quite expecting this huge um, response that people would have. So these are difficult to manufacture molecules. Uh, there probably is some manufacturing hurdles that they have to overcome. But I think it was a, a conflagration of a number of things that led to this current hellscape in which we live. Because I always tell my patients, these are the, the greatest and the worst things that ever happened to us. Yeah, and so you mentioned something that's important for us to make sure that all the attendees know if they're not already aware, but these drugs, right, originally were for treating diabetes. <clears throat> now there's these weight loss indications. And so this, these shortages, when they exist, impact more than just patients who could potentially benefit from the weight loss effects, but they also will impact uh, patients who need these drugs for their diabetes management. Um, so that's, something that we should be considering when we start thinking through, you know, impacts on equity, right? And who's able to access these drugs and at what cost. And so shortages are one of the barriers, but it's also been the case that at least for weight loss indications, right? It has been difficult to gain access to these drugs, you know, whether or not there's a shortage and that's due to, you know, issues around cost and, um, you know, insurance design. So, you know, just based on your personal experiences as, you know, prescribers, dispensers, what are some of the, the barriers that patients with different types of insurance might face when trying to obtain this, these drugs for weight loss? Or those without insurance, right? <laughs> so, uh, Gina, did you want to start, or I, I um, you, you know, you're probably on the front lines of it, but I, you know, certainly, you know, I can just speak from looking at, you know, some of the insurance plans that we're involved with, you know, and the questions of Medicaid in particular, whether Medicaid will pay for those those drugs. Uh, Medicare just announced that they're going to pay for the drugs um, for indications for primary prevention or 
prevention of cardiac disease, but but certainly cost. You know, most health plans will have what they'll call a formulary or some type of prior authorization criteria because of the expense of these drugs, meaning that you'll have to often try less expensive drugs or other older, if you will, more established drugs um, first before you might progress to one of the, the GLP-1 drugs. Yes, and I mean, we could go on and on about this. So the the formularies, the you know, the prescription benefit manager that works for the insurer that someone is um, employed by, they're making these behind the scenes deals, and those deals can change from year to year. But with the explosion of the Incretin mimetics onto the scene, people are doing the math and realizing, you know, if if the if the pharmaceutical companies are not playing ball in terms of cost reduction, and if insurers are bearing um, a significant portion of the costs, and there's not as much cost sharing with with the employer, I mean the employee or the the individuals, then some of these systems are going to go bankrupt. And as much as I want to advocate for patients that you know, these these companies have made wonderful medicines and these are terrific products, but we also have to be stewards of the resources that are available. And so we already know if Medicare covers it for everyone, they're talking about covering it as secondary prevention for those who have established cardiovascular disease. So that's going to be a smaller subset. But if they covered it for the indicated population of these medications, it really would bankrupt Medicare if... Um, there is no change in the cost, the prescription costs. And so patients are trying to navigate this. They're navigating shortages. Their insurer may decide, oh, we covered it this year, but not next year. We had with medications like Ozempic, FDA approved for treatment of diabetes. Wagovi, FDA approved for treatment of weight. Well, there was a time when there were insurers that thought, you know, in, Ozempic's a great medicine, we're going to cover it without a prior authorization. And so then there were a number of individuals without diabetes who were being prescribed appropriately for obesity. Um, and then the insurers got wise to that, like, oh, no, we can't afford this. So then you have patients who started on a medication that's meant to be chronic, then told, nope, you don't have diabetes, you don't do this. And we don't, many insurers have a rider where no weight control medications are approved at all. And it can't, you can't provide a medical reason around that. It is, it is ironclad. And then you're you're left with um a clinical conundrum, not an insurmountable one, but a clinical conundrum. And so that has been quite difficult to navigate. And now you have institutions like University of Texas, which has removed uh, coverage of these Incretin therapies. You have Mayo, which now has a two-year cap or a $20,000 limit. So we're going to have to navigate, well, if I start someone on it and they only have two years to be on it, how can we optimize that time and what do we do to off-ramp them? And uh, so these are just some some of the issues. Yeah, no, this is this is great, right? So that these drugs work very well but they have a high cost. If you are a Medicare beneficiary, you know, until very recently, there was, there was really no way to get this drug covered unless it was, I guess, prescribed off label to you or something. You can now get it covered if you have this cardiac um, indication. Many Medicaid programs, right, do not currently cover these drugs. And it's as- It's Michigan does. But mm -hmm. great. We okay. plug for Michigan. I think there's, I think there are three, three or four that cover it. Yeah, there was just a paper out recently in one of the JAMA journals that looked at this, and I think four sounds right, but I'm not totally sure on that number, right? And then, yeah, in, many private insurers are not covering it, or they do, but with many utilization controls, perhaps. And so there's a clear cost barrier, right? especially if you're low income, right? If you're uninsured or if you're in Medicaid. And so this kind of sets up the context we're in where 
these compounded options become, you know, an affordable option for many people, um, especially those who maybe had their, you know, their treatment interrupted for reasons Dr. Craftson was, was mentioning. And so, you know, there's, there's clear potential benefit for patients, but what are some of the, the risks that might come with, with using these compounded medications? Mm. I'm happy to start I know, with I know that's a big question because it yeah. depends on a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, um, and I'm happy to happy to start with that. But again, I think we could probably both of us talk a long time about just that question alone. Um, if, first of all, which I think the FDA has come out, or I know the FDA has come out on record about, is at least initially the compounded medications with um semaglutide were salt forms of semaglutide. So semaglutide sodium, semaglutide acetate, and we just don't have any data on those two salt forms. So ostensibly they might work, but we just don't know that that's not the form of semaglutide that's been studied in, in any of the clinical trials. Um, the other big point I think is we, and this was part of what the video said too, is we don't know where the source products come from. That I did spend a bit of time in preparing for this talk, trying to see where, if anywhere, you could get the source chemicals. And the major, there's a couple major um, sellers, if you will, of products that you buy. If you're a compounding pharmacy, where do you go to to buy those source ingredients? Um, probably the largest one and the one that's probably most well-respected in the U.S. is um, PCCA or um, compounding. It, it, it's basically a uh, entity that sells products for compounding pharmacies. They don't have any form of semaglutide or terzepatide on their inventory list. Um, go down the list, there's a couple others. They don't stock them. Um, we did find one, um, I worked with one of my colleagues who's one of the um, best compounding pharmacists that I know to say, you know, where do you get it? You have friends that work for compounding pharmacies in, in the Denver area, where do they get it? Um, I did find one from China, um, but it, again, it's it may be fine, but it's not necessarily, it's not an ingredient that, or it's not something that would be necessarily recognized by the FDA as a acknowledged source of getting the active ingredient. Um, so there's a big concern of, you know, what in fact is in the lyophilized powder that you can get from this particular um, provider. So we don't know. Um, about that. Um, so I'll stop there. That could go probably on and on, but let's just say that trying to get the source ingredient is unclear where you're getting it from. Is it India? Is it China? Is it inspected by the FDA? Um, the salt forms we know haven't been studied. Um, so I'll, I'll stop for a minute and let um, Dr. Craftson comment. Yeah, so I think uh, the pharmacologic safety issues uh, are well summarized, but there, there are a lot of other factors that need to be considered. One being the further erosion of the relationship with the primary care provider and the medical home model. You are divorcing care away from someone who is supposed to be your advocate and know what's going on. You're doing this relatively a lot of times in secret where you're using um, either in the medical spa or the other uh, institution, they have sort of their paid individuals who can write a prescription for you. We have a um, simplification of obesity care as if we can medicate it away, as if it's not the complex condition that it is, as if it doesn't involve so many other aspects. Um, so I've been doing obesity care for 15 years, and I can tell you, um, when I started this, I had other colleagues, endocrinologists who were like, why are you doing that? It's such a waste of your brain. You know, this is such an easy thing or a, kind of a mindless thing. You just tell them exercise more, eat less. Um, and so it's been very gratifying to see how the science has supported 
the idea that this is a very complex uh, condition. We have the neurobiology, we have the hormones, but we also have the the human stuff of it. This is we're not just mice or other animals. There's there's many of these different layers. So who's actually screening these individuals for eating disorders? Who's actually looking to see through a comprehensive medical record about potential contraindications? Who's actually counseling about the potential side effects? And then it really is getting into this false urgency where we would say like, I needed this and I needed it yesterday. And so I should already be on it. And if I'm not, that's a miscarriage of, of medicine and justice. And it's prompting people to make these rest, rash decisions and not to treat it on the time horizon that it more accurately follows, which is a chronic long-term condition. And it's making it seem like the choices between no treatment and amazing treatment. And so I am depriving them if I don't then consider compounded medications. And that also is a false dichotomy that we need to address. So I'll stop there because I keep blathering on, but, but there are many of these other um, factors that should be considered when talking about compounded prescription. And the fact that people are profiting off of what they're giving. I mean, there's this inherent conflict of interest. I could prescribe zero prescriptions for semaglutide in a year, and I could prescribe 20,000, and I will be financially the same. And so that is also a um, is problematic with, with this whole uh, side industry. Yeah, I might mention, I, I saw an ad just last week of um, looking for investors that you can make five hundred to eight hundred thousand a year running a weight loss clinic. That they set it up for you. You're not a physician or not a healthcare provider. That they'll provide that for you. They're just looking for investors to to run the clinic and promising huge amounts of money as to engage with the clinics as well. Hmm. So, what are the if a patient came to you and mentioned that they're considering a compounded, you know, GLP-1 product, what, what questions would you want to ask of the provider or the compounding pharmacy? What questions would you want the patient to be able to ask and have answered so that you could feel comfortable, if, if you could feel comfortable with them using this drug? Okay, I get, well, I'm happy to start. Um, and I I will disclose that I'm on one of the trials at our, our campus. Um, so I've given this a lot of thought personally um, with, you know, what kind of next steps for, for me um, personally and, and what I w might do or might not do. Um, I would, first of all, I'd want to be managed by somebody like a Dr. Craftson or, you know, my primary care provider that knows what they're doing. And, you know, there's a lot of other concomitant factors that you're going to look at, such as, you know, your, your lipid profile, your, your blood pressure, um, other risk factors um, associated with, with why you might be taking the medication. I think that's very important. It's very frightening to me to see some of the ads, for, again, for the weight loss clinic, like you only have to be checked once a year. That's very concerning to me as a potential patient that you're not going to have, I think, the appropriate amount of oversight to ensure the safety of those medications. So I think it's important that you're working as part of a provider that specializes either in weight loss in conjunction with your primary care provider or your primary care provider if they're trained and comfortable providing those medications. Um, I think in terms of the pharmacy, I'd want to know where is that pharmacy? Who's compounding it? I think there's a couple in the Denver area that I would trust. Um, a lot that I wouldn't, and I'm not going to name names. I don't think that is necessarily appropriate in this venue, but happy to talk to anyone offline. Um, but I do think there's a couple that do compounding pretty well and that I trust to do it. Um, anecdotally, I did, as I mentioned, spend a bit of time going out on the websites, just looking in the, the Denver metro area of 
compounding pharmacies, I found one that, again, I won't mention their name, but they were actually compounding and advertising a drug by the name of retitrutide that is not even FDA approved. So they're compound, you know, allegedly compounding, advertising, marketing, and prescribing a drug that's not even approved by the FDA. And I think for the unknowing consumer, um, they wouldn't know that any differently. So I would ask, and I did reach out to this pharmacy and say, hey, do you have any um, stability, sterility, te sterility testing? You know, I'm considering um, looking at compounded um, drugs in this category. What can you provide me? And they literally did not respond. So it's, um, I think it's looking at, um, and I see a comment coming up about trusting the source API, but I think it's compounding, it's trusting the compounder where they get the source API, the con conditions by which they're actually compounding the medication, and um, understanding, you know, what are they licensed as and have they had any complaints against their license. Even looking at some of the compounding pharmacies that are listed out there currently that do are supplying compounded um, semaglutide. They, if if you look closely, they've had a number of complaints um, against their registration by the FDA inspections with unsterile practices. So I'll stop there because I I spoke plenty, but um, those are the questions that I would ask. So I I do not prescribe uh, or write prescriptions for compounded uh, incretin mimetics at all. Um, and I think this is where the relationship is so important because I do I do ask my patients about it or if they're frustrated and they've they've considered going that route because then it opens the conversation to really the problem is when we overly fixate on the weight number um, and we're not really looking at overall what are the health goals in in the long term and if we are able to redirect toward the health goals and toward individual aspects such as reducing insulin or um, being able to go on that trip to Ireland or whatever it is, um, you know, we can, we can discuss, well, I do think that you're a good candidate for these kind of medications and it is super frustrating that they are not available right now or intermittently available. Um, but it doesn't mean that there are no treatments out there. For some folks, it's where we have a really good discussion about why have they not yet considered bariatric surgery, or is this maybe a point where we could pursue that highly effective treatment, or are there, there are all these other older medications that are still quite effective, and we could be using them maybe in the interim until we get them on a nutrient stimulated hormone type medication. But um, trying to keep the lines of communication open because you don't want folks just to leave you and then go into the wild west. It is indeed the wild yeah. west. And we have so many other good partners, I think in the chat, you know, you have, um, we keep, we're not talking, this is not the focus of today, but the partnership with our dietitian colleagues, with our, uh, with the pharmacy team, with our mental health professionals, it is, really is a team, a team effort. And so trying to say like, oh, there's a season to focus on these kind of things. Maybe we can refocus on mental health for now, and then we can work on stability. And then as these medications come back online, maybe that will be uh, a season where we work more on aggressive weight loss. Yeah, great. I want to, I want to just touch on a few other potential safety concerns that I know have arisen. And so Dr. Moore, you mentioned um, that in some cases there have been these salt forms being compounded and, you know, that's not the form approved by the FDA. And so we don't have, you know, phase three trials on the safety and effectiveness of, of those salt forms. Uh, you could say something similar about um, versions that are the GLP-1 compounded with some added ingredient, like a vitamin B uh, ingredient. You'll see things like that advertised. And so I was wondering if there's anything you could say on that topic. You know, why do we see, first of all, that kind of additive compound being produced and then, you know, 
what what should we think about how that might impact the safety or effectiveness of of the compounded product? There are a few questions there. Um, I'll try to unpack them a bit, but so I think taking a step back, it's it's good to acknowledge um, under the circumstances that the FDA does allow compounding. So legally, you're not allowed to compound a commercially available drug unless there is some health reason, if you will, to to compound that medication for somebody. So for example, if somebody has an allergy to one of the excipients or ingredients in the commercially available product, or another common scenario is if somebody can't swallow a tablet, you can compound a suspension. Or if there is um, a drug shortage. And so that's the case by which the current compounders are around, are able to get around the current FDA regulations is because there's drug shortages. And both um, um, semaglutide or semaglutide, I know people pronounce it differently, um, or terzepatide are both on the drug shortages list. So you can get around the notion of it being commercially available because of the shortages. Um, my take on the the vitamin B issue, and I'd be curious to hear what Dr. Craftson has to say about that, is that they're compounding it with this addition of vitamin B, which I can't see necessarily has any benefit to the patient, just to say that it's not identical to the commercially available product and get around some of the compounding regulations. I don't see that it necessarily has any benefit. And then the salt forms are just just that. They were able to get the salt forms. Um, that's what they were able to get. They went ahead and compounded it. Um, you know, salt forms are pretty ubiquitous with most medications and they can affect some of the half-life and bioavailability. But um, for for the most part, you know, I think that's what they were able to get and they went ahead and compounded it with what they were able to get. Yeah, I think there's some non-rigorous, poor, I think some poor study about how B12 might decrease the nausea but I think it, it pretty much is not, not sound. And they, it, it goes in, and you know, there historically has been this idea where B12 would help people lose weight. So some people take B12 shots because they think it helps them lose weight. So it is continuing this preying on folks to make things sound super healthy and that this is just part of this you know, medical spa kind of thing, exclusive, but at some affordable price, which really is not addressing any of the health equity problems. Um, so I think it's more of the snake oil vein of things rather than any true science. And, you know, am I, <clears throat> am I correct in assuming that, you know, were these shortages to end and supply of these drugs were to become sustainable over the long term, this combining of the GLP-1 with a B vitamin or, or something would be a way forward for compounders to continue providing this type of product legally? Or is that is that not correct? I, I think it's make as much as you can, make as much money as you can until the FDA or Lilly or Novo Nordisk send you a cease and desist letter is my take on it. Um, and, you know, I think that we're in this window right now where compounding is available. They're able to provide it um, and provide access at a, a lower cost. I know of a few individuals and friends that have benefited themselves personally from taking compounded medications. Um, but I think that it's not an altruistic intent for many of these compounders. I think that they're they're probably going to continue to make as much as they can until they get they get shut down. I'm hopeful that once more of these medications get on the market, I'm encouraged by some of the results of the cardiac trials that I think um, was certainly compelling for me as an individual. But I think. More importantly, I think we can view view this as a chronic disease and view some of the pre cardiac 
protective effects as beneficial for patients. And hopefully with more drugs coming on the market, we'll start to see the prices come down and, and hopefully the medications become more available and more affordable for patients. Yeah, and I'll, I'll note, I think you're right that as more of these drugs come on the market, you know, competitive forces should push prices down somewhat. But I'll add that if it is also likely that, you know, at least semaglutide will end up being one of Medicare's selected drugs for price negotiations in one of the, you know, upcoming years, if not <laughs> next year. And so that will be another way that the price may end up coming down and, you know, access could be expanded to those who can really benefit from these drugs. Um, we'll shift, shift gears a little bit away from, from these safety concerns. And, <clears throat> you know, I think you mentioned in your slides, Dr. Moore, that the 503A, so the traditional compounders are generally overseen by state boards of pharmacy, not the FDA. And so I'm wondering if, you know, you could speak to what steps some of these states, state boards of pharmacies have taken to regulate traditional compounders uh, in this context of, you know, GLP-1 drugs or, you know, or on the other hand, you know, what, what could Colorado consider to promote safe, effective, equitable use of these compounded products? Um, that is a hard question. The, the, our state of Colorado has, has fairly lengthy compounding regulations um, written in the rules in the State Board of Pharmacy. Um, and, I, and the board inspectors are are quite diligent, I think, when they come around and inspect pharmacies. And I, I don't practice in a dispensing environment any longer. I teach pharmacy law, and um, so I don't work in that environment. So I defer to maybe some of my colleagues that that do work in that. I think that where some of the Wild West occurs is, um, and this is not to pick on physician colleagues, because I think there's a lot of very good physicians out there doing a lot of good things, but our rules in Colorado allow physician delegation for most any task um, that's when the, within the physician scope. So I think that you've got cases in which there's med spas and others that are delegating some of those um, compounding and dispensing roles to, in, to individuals that don't operate under the strict rules that that we do as pharmacy. I think we tend to have our pharmacy lens on in terms of how we think of it. And that's not to say that all of the pharmacies out there are perfect. There's plenty of examples of individuals that aren't, but but for all intents and purposes, we have to, if we wanna keep our license and registration in good standing with the board, we have to follow those rules fairly carefully. So I want to move to some audience questions soon here, but, um, you know, last, I thought of another question I wanted to ask re relating to, to safety. And so, you know, there have been these reports from like poison centers, right? That patients, um, they've seen a, a large increase in like overdoses, um, of these sorts of drugs that lead to, you know, pretty uncomfortable stomach pain, persistent vomiting, nausea, right? Um, <clears throat> and so how should we think about the relationship between some of these, these compounded products and that likelihood of, you know, difficulties with dosing? This is another area in which perhaps, you know, clinicians and pharmacists could be prepared to offer advice to patients they know who might be using these drugs around how to safely uh, inject, you know, or sterilize the the products that they're receiving. Yeah, so the reports I've seen come out um, mostly relate to those those vials that we saw pictures of earlier as opposed to the, the auto injectors that you can dial up your dose or come prepackaged with the correct dose um, in which patients 
don't know. You know, they're probably given a vial, they're given an insulin syringe and maybe some instructions, but hard to understand or, you know, it's probably scary, you know, when you're first self-injecting, you know, something. So I think depending on where the site that that medication is dispensed from, the I think there's a, some importance with instructing the patient and probably observing the first dose, even if it's a telehealth um, type scenario. Yeah, so it's it's not that patients can't use vials and syringes. We've learned that with insulin, but we've also learned with insulin that you know crazy things can happen, and that can happen with pens or with with vials and syringes. And so that whole patient instruction piece is is so important. And also, if you have a product and you're not even sure what the concentration is, or you're not even sure what's in it, then you know it's. I mean, we don't have, we don't really have a solid foundation upon which that they would, you know, have dosing guidance in that way. So that is part of that. When you separate it out from comprehensive care, you're removing a number of the natural safeguards that should be built in to the system. But yeah, I don't want to pretend like if someone... <laughs> My fear is that, you know, you have this indication for secondary prevention of obesity, and then you have a physician who's not really involved in obesity care, but they're like, oh, you should be on this. So, I mean, we've seen this happen with SGLT2 inhibitors as well as the, the indications expand. The less counseling that goes on, the more problems that happen, and people don't realize that there could be these side effects that happen, and they're not counseled appropriately. Um, we also have rules and, in, um, you know, let's say you're prescribed Wigovi and your insurer says you have to lose 5% in 90 days to get a renewal of your prior authorization. There's also that built-in problem where someone may have, have GI side effects and they could have tolerated it if we went more slowly and weren't under this time pressure. Um, but then the system is sort of forcing people to try to lose that amount of weight in that amount of time. Um, similarly, if someone is getting compounded SEMA because they're trying to get ready for a wedding or some other reason, then people just think more is better, faster is better, and it really opens it up for these, these problems to happen. All right, please, please, if you're in the audience, feel free to send any questions into the chat. I'm going to try to turn to some that we received prior to the uh, to the webinar today. But I think this one is this is probably a more general question, not necessarily about compounded products, but how should we be thinking about the you know utility of these medications in pediatric populations? Is that, you know, what does the data say there? Is there, is there a use case there or should we be considering other avenues for, for weight loss first? I'm going to defer to Dr. Crofson. On that. <laughs> I was going to say, I was going <laughs> to defer. Uh, <laughs> so we, we know medication like Saxenda has been approved for pediatric use in our teen population. Um, you know, it, it's times like these that I, I'm sort of glad I'm an adult physician. I think the world of pediatrics it, and pediatric obesity is, is quite challenging. And so probably what has been most successful would be family-based interventions where you're addressing holistically the family, the, the guardians or parents, as well as the child. And medications can be a part of that um, Oh, and thank you about the update on the SEMA for teens. So, you know, it it is something that should be considered for, for this population, but uh, I don't have expertise in that. I know that some of our pediatric colleagues are asking us about our experiences with these medications to help bolster their own uh, knowledge base, but Again, the, the economics of it are going to be challenging, especially with insurance coverage and changing coverage. And if you have a vulnerable teen who then loses coverage, I mean, there are a lot of things to 
be considered in all of that, but they are considered chronic um, indications. <clears throat> uh, another audience question we had received pertains to sublingual compounded semaglutide. I have seen this type of product being advertised here in the Denver area on websites. You know, what, what should we be thinking about that? Is that going to work the same way as an injected, you know, semaglutide will, or do we not know much about how that might work? I know now the other way we might answer this question is, you know, what sorts of trials are there for oral GLP-1s underway, you know, in phase three or phase two or whatever? Well, from, and this, this is not an area that I was able to find a lot of information about, but um, my understanding on that is that they're taking commercially available rebelsis and essentially compounding them into trochies um, so that they're dissolved sublingually. Um, our guts do a pretty good job of um, breaking down peptide molecules and therefore not as effective as the injectable route. But the idea is that if you take them sublingually, that you'll get more bioavailability as opposed to you know the bypass, bypassing the liver and making it more readily available. But I've just not seen, I think it's a from what I can see, more of a theoretical argument. I don't know. Um, I haven't. I haven't seen data on it, but yeah, the updated oral sema is supposed to surmount the bioavailability issues with rebelsis because those of us who have used rebelsis, you know, if I basically never use rebelsis because I, I would rather. I can always, almost always convince someone to go on a once weekly injectable if I feel like that is what they need. You know, it just takes a little bit of education, a little bit of showing them the injection devices, and it tends to be more effective than rebelsis. So the updated oral SEMA will, will fill in a, a gap, hopefully be less subject to shortages. Um, and then the smaller molecule incretin mimetics that come out will also be trying to address this issue as well as some of the cost issues. So there's there's some uh, positive things ahead from an oral standpoint, but for the majority of my patients, the injectables are, it's a surmountable issue. Um, so yeah, and I have, I have, no um, knowledge about the, the sublingual question. Well, we are nearing the end here. I want to give either of you any last opportunity for parting statements or wisdom, if you'd like, though no pressure. Uh, up to you. Oh, you've asked lots of good questions. I'm not sure what else I can add. I mean, I think we have a lot of experts on on this call and appreciate some of the chat questions and, and thoughtful comments. Um, I, I personally think it's a fascinating area and it's going to be very interesting to watch it the next you know, couple of years. Mm -hmm. I think the issue has been great to uncover a lot of we have a lot to lament for in medicine for how we've addressed individuals. Um, dealing with excess weight, obesity, and, and the problems they're in. And so this is showing so many of the cracks in the system, but I would say the compounding is a, a false promise and should be avoided. Um, and we should recognize that there are alternatives. I also really hope that we can get beyond pitting individuals with one condition against pitting individuals with others saying that those with diabetes are deserving and those with obesity are not deserving. Um, I think that serves no good purpose and really we should be redirecting our efforts in more constructive ways. So. Thank you, both of you. Um, those are great points to finish on. And yes, this is a, a topic that will continue to evolve, right? There are a number of further drugs under study. The policy landscape and the insurance coverage landscape is rapidly changing on this topic. And so we can expect that the compounding market will also be rapidly evolving <laughs> over the years. Um, great, so thank you everyone who attended. 
Uh, please, you'll receive this survey. Please complete that if you're able. Our final event of the year will be on April 22nd at noon, and that will be a, a town hall, I believe, to investigate uh, ethics that arise for students in pharmacy. Um, so again, thank you for attending. And this recording will be available in a few days. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity to contribute. Yeah, thank you all.